John Palmer joins me this week to talk about yeast health and maturation. This is Beersmith Podcast number 168. This is Beersmith Podcast number 168, and it's late March 2018. This week, John Palmer joins me to discuss the maturation process in beer. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running a great deal right now. Get 20% off your subscription when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers, and you can read my new column called Ask the Experts. Take advantage of their special deal when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018 at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the new BrewVision thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the BeerSmith cloud and set updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, BeerSmith Mobile. The mobile version of BeerSmith is the perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with friends, and act as a pocket brew timer. Check out BeerSmith Mobile at beersmith.com mobile or on Google Play, iTunes, or the Amazon App Store. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back my good friend, John Palmer. John is author of the top-selling brewing book in the world, How to Brew, and he just released a new edition last summer. John is also co-author of the book on water and uh, also the book Brewing Classic Styles. John, it is always a pleasure to have you back to the show. Well, thank you very much, Brad. It's great to be here. How are you doing? I guess you just got back from Mexico, I understand. Yeah, we had the Ensenada Beer Fest down there. Um, I try to go every year. I missed it one year when I was in New Zealand, but uh, just a, a great beer fest. Um, this year is two days, uh, three days of conference and two days of beer fest itself. Um, live bands, all the microbreweries from the Baja and Sonoma regions were there. And uh, just a great time. Took our good friend John Blickman with me. That's scary. And, John um, Blickman yeah. in Mexico, that sounds like trouble. <laughs> yeah, he had a great time. <laughs> and uh, he was very, very pleased with how many people uh, knew of him and used his products down there. So That's it was great. a good time. Um, well, you recently said at a, in a presentation you were doing that we are in the golden age of beer brewing. What do you mean by that, John? Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, if you think about it, today there are more brewers and more beer drinkers than ever before in the history of the earth. And yeah. the and it's interesting when you look back at the 20th century, I mean, we have undergone some major paradigm shifts in brewing in terms of, you know, uh, malt varieties, malt modification, uh, diastatic power in the new barley varieties, um, new hop varieties all over the place, new yeast varieties available. We understand the yeast genome. We invented pH, for crying out loud. I mean, so many things have changed in the last 100 years of brewing that uh, we are re we're brewing you know, better beer than ever before. So it truly is the golden age of brewing. Awesome. Well, um, you recently did a presentation where you focused on uh, maturation and the role yeast plays in maturation. Um, so let's start with what you mean by the maturation process. Okay. Well, Ed, this goes back to, you know, my own um, interest in, in the brewing process. And as I was revising how to brew, um, the practice of lagering is one that's always kind of puzzled me. Um, you know, why, why lager? Why do we chill the beer, you know, and say that this, you know, changes the character and that it helps the yeast make a better beer? How does this work? Um, and so as I started researching that and reading uh, papers by, you know, uh, people like uh, David Ryder, Graham Stewart, Charlie Bamforth, you know, uh, Professor Ludwig Narsis, um, a lot, you know, a lot of pieces started coming together. And if you think about uh, the 
the lagering process or the maturation process. You know, the yeast are producing all these, uh, you know, esters and ethanol and carbon dioxide. They're also producing lots of other little byproducts as well. And it's these little byproducts that give a, you know, newly fermented beer its kind of green character that uh, lagering tries to, you know, um, maturate out. Um, so they say, you know, give the beer time, chill it down, you know, help the yeast clean up this green character, this uh, rough character that the beer has. Well, uh, yeast as a living organism, I mean, uh, they work better warm. And so well, how does how does cooling the beer come into this? And that's... Um, and that's so. That's what got me started on on trying to understand uh, the yeast process and how maturation works, and what uh, compounds the yeast are trying to clean up uh, at the end of fermentation. And um, I guess the the take home from this is that uh, yeast really don't care about maturation. Uh, that's that's where the brewer comes in. So as the brewer, we need to create the conditions, the favorable conditions for the yeast to clean up the beer and produce the best beer possible. Well, some time ago, I uh, did a presentation on off flavors and it was pretty interesting. I went through all the, was it 16 or 17 off flavors on the beer judge uh, score sheet. Yeah. And the vast majority of those are caused by yeast. Uh, something like 12 of the 16, I think, are caused, uh, are yeast related issues. Um, right. Does maturation really start with uh, the health of your yeast? Yes, it does. Um, Charlie Bamforth on your show uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a really good uh, discussion of yeast. And I think uh, this today's talk will kind of take that uh, a little bit further and maybe go into some of the details. But um, yeah, as Charlie says, the vigor of your fermentation is you know vital to the quality of the beer you know the stronger the healthier the fermentation um the less off flavors you will have and the more and the more robust the beer quality will be i already lost yeah. track of the train of thought here that's okay um, <laughs> what, uh, what you... no no i was asking about yeast and maturation basically yes, does yes. does good uh, maturate does the maturation process really start from the very beginning with the yeast Yes, yes. Um, there's there's a couple of key tenets, if you will. Um, one, you want to control the fermentation, obviously. So you do that by uh, looking at your original gravity, your pitching rate. You want to control the amount of growth, the total amount of growth, and you want to control the rate of growth um, to brew the beer consistently, you know, say if you're brewing the same recipe batch to batch to batch, you know, week after week, um, in terms of just general brewing practice, again, you want to ensure a, a strong, vigorous fermentation, one that will have controlled uh, release of byproducts and have um, plenty of healthy active yeast towards the end of fermentation to clean up those byproducts. And that really is maturation in a nutshell. It is the total fermentation of the beer, the complete, you know, uh, conversion of, star of fermentable sugars to uh, ethanol, carbon dioxide, esters, aldehydes, and all these other little intangibles that give a, a beer its good flavor, as well as the, uh, the cleaning up of excess byproducts such as diacetyl and acetaldehyde, um, that is, you know, the buttery flavor and the green apple flavor that can persist in some beers, and get those cleaned up and, you know, have a beer that is ready to carbonate and ready to package within a few weeks as opposed to a few months. Mm -hmm. um, well, can you talk for a minute about the yeast life cycle and the major stages that yeast go through as we, uh, as we go through the brewing process? Sure. Um, and I, I just want to mention that um, all of today's discussion is covered in the newest edition of How to Brew. This is all stuff I learned and... There's you your know, website there, howtobrew.com, uh, I'll mention. 
Right. And actually, you won't find a lot of this on that first edition. Uh, right. I right. did update a few things, but in, you know, for the for the latest and greatest, get the the fourth edition of How to Brew. The new book and, right uh, there. There's the cover on the for oh, folks yeah, on the video. Go. There you go. HowToBrew.com. And anyway, so yeast life cycle. Uh, the yeast have three phases to their life cycle. Um, you start out with a physical growth phase. That is, they come out of hibernation. They, when they're pitched to a new wort, um, you know, at this point they're they're hungry. Uh, they take in nutrients. They take in oxygen, and they physically grow. The yeast cell physically grows in size. It takes in nutrients into what we call its vacuole. Um, and the vacuole inside a yeast cell is kind of its nutrient storage closet, its pantry, if you will. And once it has reached sufficient size and it's, it's built up its uh, nutrient reserves, its lipid reserves, now it can start to reproduce and it enters what we call the high growth phase where the yeast cell starts budding. I think, I think in that first phase is where oxygen plays a critical role, right, in building up sterols, I think? Yes. Yeah. Um, oxygen is uh, is indeed a vital nutrient for the yeast. They use it in the synthesis of sterols, of uh, fatty acids, of uh, amino acids that the yeast cells needs as part of its uh, growth. Um, most of these nutrients it can take in from the wort, but um, yeast is a very simple organism, and it has one. Uh, avenue for taking in nutrients, if you will, one uh, pathway through the membrane. Um, this is oversimplification, but basically, um, there is a, a you know specifically shaped door that it takes in these nutrients. Okay, mm -hmm. so it can only take them in you know one at a time or sequentially, and uh, if it has a long line in front of that door. It'll, you know, it, may, it will not see or be able to take in other nutrients that it needs, and so it's able to use oxygen and other compounds to synthesize nutrients that it needs if they're not readily available, and that may be simply due to be the line that's stacked up outside the yeast cell. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, they, the uh, that early adaptive growth phase that where the, the yeast cell, the individual yeast cell, physically grows is followed by the high growth phase where the yeast cell starts to bud and uh, and uh, divide. And when the yeast cell divides, it shares its vacuole, its nutrient reserves, with the daughter cell. And so really the limiting uh, step the limi uh, to growth for the yeast cell is its total nutrient reserves. And it can only divide that uh, vacuole so many times before those, you know, they it hits the bare minimum. And uh, so then the yeast cell will stop reproducing. Typically in a fermentation, that may be three to four divisions. Mm -hmm. And then the daughter cells, you know, when they split off, they are also going to go through that adaptive, that physical growth phase till they absorb nutrients to a, and reach a certain size where they can start dividing as well. So we have an adaptive phase, we have a high growth phase. When the yeast cell has reached its limit for reproduction, it is you know down to its um, bare minimum of nutrients. Um, by this time, the uh, wort nutrients are probably exhausted you know, later in fermentation, uh, the yeast cell looks around, says, I don't see any more food. I can't reproduce. It's time to hibernate, you know, time to, you know, build up its triolose and, um, what's the other one? Glycogen reserves and, you know, settle, settle out, hibernate, um, and go into what we call the stationary phase as it waits for new nutrients to arrive. So the yeast cell has those three basic phases of life, physical growth, high growth, and then stationary phase, as it's called. And then how do those uh, phases map into the brewing cycle? Well, um, I think from a brewer's point of view, you know, we pitch the yeast, we have the adaptive phase or the lag time as, you know, we, we aerate the word to be, we wait, you know, 12 hours or so for the, the yeast to adapt and start fermentation. 
Uh, we have the attenuative phase where, yes, the yeast is undergoing their high growth, the airlock's bubbling like crazy, and we're seeing you know a rapid decrease in the gravity of the wort as the sugars are consumed. Um, then there's a maturation phase at the end of fermentation where we expect the yeast to clean up uh, these byproducts and convert the beer from kind of a green flavor to more of a maturated flavor. Get rid of the diacetyl, the vicinal diketones. Um, get rid of uh, the residual acetaldehyde, which has, can have that green apple or cidery character depending on your ingredients. Um, then... When fermentation is over, we expect the yeast to flocculate and settle out. Uh, they go into their stationary phase. So in comparing the yeast life cycle with the brewer's expectations, um, you can see that there's really no maturation phase as far as the yeast are concerned. And that's where we, as the brewers, come in. It's up to us to create the conditions for successful maturation. And so the, uh, so the maturation process really becomes one of um, allowing the thing, you know, allowing the yeast to settle out plus allowing these uh, byproducts to really uh, sort of settle out from fermentation, right? Well. Or, or be mopped up, I guess. Yeah. Actually, more mopping up. It, maturation is a function of the yeast. And so the question to the brewer, the challenge to the brewer is to say, what do I need to do to keep those yeast active and taking up that diacetyl, taking up that acetaldehyde and, you know, maturating the beer, finishing the fermentation of the beer before they settle out. Um, and I, th I think this is a, a key point, you know, to realize as a brewer is that you know, fermentation of our beer is not done until the beer is fully maturated. It's not just reaching terminal gravity. It's full maturation, full cleanup of these byproducts um, before the beer can be considered done fermenting. Once it's done, then we can allow the yeast to settle out. We could chill the beer to help encourage the settling of the yeast, the settling of the haze, in, a sense, in essence, lagering the beer to clarify it, and then it's ready to package. So uh, the way we do that is we uh, have adequate pitching rates so and adequate yeast nutrients and aeration so that we have a vigorous fermentation and the yeast, there's enough yeast that they will uh, consume all of the fermentable sugars in the wort before they have exhausted those lipid reserves in their vacuole and, um, and, and you know, done reproducing. So you have, in essence, active, hungry yeast still looking for food at the end of fermentation, and now they can turn to the diacetyl, turn to the acetaldehyde, which are, you know, uh, less powerful energy sources that compared to sugars, but still, you know, uh, energy sources nonetheless, and the yeast will take these up and, you know, use them to continue their, their life cycle. Um, when those are fully exhausted, now they would enter their stationary or you know hibernation phase. Well, let's talk for a minute about, in detail about these um, yeast byproducts. What are the major ones, and uh, how how do they play a role in maturation? Okay. Um, well, a lot of your yeast byproducts are created um, as part of the high growth phase, um, and the for instance, uh, diacetyl. Let's start with diacetyl. Um, as Charlie said, it's a vicinal gut diketone. It is produced by uh, a non-biological mechanism. It is produced simply by uh, a chemical oxidation of what we call acetohydroxy acids that the yeast gives off as a waste product while it's growing. And um, so, okay, let's see. So you have a yeast cell. It is taken in sugars. It is generating generating its pyruvate, which is you know energy chemical. Mm -hmm. And as it's doing so, um, it is kicking off acetohydroxy acid as a waste product. Now, normally the yeast is going to retain that acetohydroxy within itself, and you know convert that into 
another waste product, a, a more reduced waste product to recover energy from it uh, a little further down the line. However, if that yeast cell is growing faster and generating more acetohydroxy than it can subsequently process, then it is going to excrete that acetohydroxy outside the cell. And really, that is usually the case. The yeast cell is, you know, has a lot of excess acetohydroxy from its metabolism and is excreting it outside the cell. Um, and that's acetaldehyde, I assume, the uh, green apple, right? No, no, no. The no. Acetohydroxy, okay. acetohydroxy is... is yeah, it is, it's its own thing. We haven't gotten to acetaldehyde oh, okay. yet. Okay. Acetaldehyde actually... Uh, let, you know, let's address that momentarily. It is much the same situation. The yeast cell is taking in sugars, creating pyruvate, um, creating acetaldehyde as an inter intermediary to the formation of the ethanol, which is its you know lowest uh, form or lowest energy waste product. You know, it's recovering energy from this reaction and generating the ethanol. And of course, uh, ethanol is alcohol, right? Yes, yes. And uh, so it's it's excreting excess acetaldehyde outside the cell as well. So you have both of these processes occurring in parallel: um, acetohydroxy on the one side and acetaldehyde on the other, uh, both being excreted. In the case of acetohydroxy, now um, this is a waste product from the yeast. It doesn't want to take that in. It's got plenty inside already. It's not you know it's not interested in it. However, um, chemically, that acetohydroxy will oxidize to create diacetyl, and it does that strictly as a function of temperature and pH. It is a chemical reaction like many others. Um, and once the acetohydroxy oxidizes to diacetyl, now it is in a form that the yeast can take up and extract energy from that diacetyl and break it down to, um, I guess, back to something else. Anyway, I forget. Anyway, uh, and use that as an energy source. Right. So uh, acetaldehyde, same thing. Um, the acetaldehyde, though, is is can be taken up directly, um, there, and there'll be lots of it in solution, except, you know, the... Uh, the sugars are a much more attractive food source uh, rather than the acetaldehyde. So um, they do they do take it in in parallel. A lot of a lot of these processes are going on, but you can it's very easy to end up with excess acetaldehyde at the end of fermentation. If the yeast are tired, if they're you know if they've done lots of repro reproduction, um, you know from a low pitching rate, uh, then they're not going to be inclined to take that up and you'll end up with acetaldehyde, green apple in your beer. Right. And um, I think acetaldehyde, if it does get processed, gets processed back into ethanol, right? Eventually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It will be, it'll be reduced to ethanol. Right. Um, another thing on the acetohydroxy, um, it's, as I said, the conversion, the chemical conversion of acetohydroxy to diacetyl um, is dependent on temperature and pH. So if you are chilling the beer um, too soon, uh, this will slow the reaction rate. You know, just um, the Arrhenius equation, you know, uh, the speed of a reaction is um, proportional Related to, to the temperature. The temperature. Yeah. Right. So as you, if you chill the beer too soon, you will slow down the con chemical conversion of the acetohydroxy to the acetyl, and you can end up with acetohydroxy in the package, you know, in the bottle or the keg. And then that, you know, if it's then warmed up subsequently, that acetohydroxy will convert to diacetyl in the package. And uh, all of a sudden, you you know, the beer has gone from tasting fine to now tasting like butter. So I assume, I assume this is the origin of the diacetyl rest, right? Diacetyl, by the way, is a buttery off flavor that ends up in the finished beer, right? Exactly, yeah. But, um, so, but you want to do a diacetyl rest to prevent that, right? Right. And so the diacetyl rest is accomplishing two things. One, that increase in temperature is helping the chemical conversion of the acetohydroxy to diacetyl so the yeast can take it up. And two, by raising the temperature, you're increasing the activity of the yeast 
uh, and giving them the, you know, boost to and the desire to take in this diacetyl as a food source. And so that's where at the towards the end of fermentation, um, the the beer temperature should be raised three to four degrees C, you know, five to eight degrees Fahrenheit and um, and, and warmed. And that will help keep the yeast active. It'll help con convert the, uh, the acetohydroxy to diacetyl, and that can be cleaned up uh, before the beer is chilled. And so you said uh, you do a diacetyl rest just by raising it a couple degrees. I, I had two questions. One is, uh, do you need to do this for ales as well? Obviously, it's important for... Um it's commonly lagers, done right. with lagers, right? Right. Um, and that's really, that is a, a great point. It is applicable to every beer style, ale and lager. Um, ale fermentations, because they're generally warmer, um, you know, are the, the conversion of the acetohydroxy to diacetyl is strictly temperature dependent. So in an ale situation, it is able to, to be converted to diacetyl much more readily, and the, there is usually sufficient yeast to clean it up towards the end of fermentation. It's when you're in a lager situation and you're you know fermenting at a cooler temperature that acetohydroxy is not converting as quickly, and um, because of the cooler temperature and without a diacetyl rest, much more of the diacetyl is able to remain behind. So, um, yeah, I do recommend a diacetyl rest or a general rise in temperature towards the end of fermentation for every uh, fermentation, every beer style. And then the second part of that question was how long do you need to do it? Um, yeah. How quickly can it can it get cleaned up? I, I think when I, I asked Charlie this question many, many years ago, we did, a I think, a whole episode on diacetyl, but I thought he said it could, in, in many cases, be cleaned up in as little as a few hours, but... That's right. It, it depends on, again, yeast health, yeast vigor, and temperature. Um, I think as a general rule of thumb, um, give the yeast as many days for a diacetyl rest as you did for the high growth phase. You know, that's probably way more time than the yeast actually need, but the extra time doesn't hurt the beer at all. Um, you know, if, uh, if you're fermenting an ale, you know, you, you look at your, your brewing week, you brew on the weekends, you pitch your yeast on Sunday and it starts fermenting by Wednesday, it's, you know, pretty well done. Um, so raise the temperature at that point towards the end of fermentation and allow it to do a diacetyl rest till the next weekend, till Saturday. And then you can, you know, that should be that two or three days of diacetyl rest should be plenty of time to clean up diacetyl and uh, other, uh, you know, acetaldehyde as well. And then you can see about chilling the beer, transferring it to a keg, et cetera. Lagers, of course, because you're cooler, are going to take a little longer time. And so, you know, add a few days to both stages. Well, um, we started this discussion just to throw a, throw a wrench in things. Um, with a, with a discussion of cold crashing, right? You said you said right. you were very interested in what role cold crashing played in the maturation process. How does that square with you know many of these transformations that are going on at higher temperatures? Right. Well, you know the yeast as an organism is you, <laughs> you know not very active at uh, cool temperatures. You get below forty degrees Fahrenheit, ten degrees C. I think that's right. No, it's more like six degrees C, um, then yeast activity really drops off. And so we have these these uh, adages, these recommendations of, you know, one week or one month per degree Plato for the, you know, beer, you know, for lagers to be lagered. Well, if you do all of your maturation warm within a couple of three days, now, you know, there is nothing for the yeast to do when they're cold, all they have to do is settle out. Um, on the other hand, there is um, anecdotal evidence um, in that the lager yeast can uh, metabolize and reduce uh, sulfites to sulfide or in sulfides to sulfates and so on um, during lagering. Um, I have not been able to 
you know, research to understand the mecha- mechanisms behind that. So um, there is, you know, what I'm saying is that there is a case for, you know, a couple of weeks at 40 degrees, somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, two to two to five degrees C, uh, and that the yeast will clean up sulfides in, in, in the wort, in the beer. Um, however, in terms of diacetyl uh, reduction, acetaldehyde reduction, that is best done warm. So when after fermentation is fully done, those off flavors are gone. You can now chill the beer, and uh, and you're chilling it simply to hasten the yeast flocculation and the settling of any haze in the beer to to clarify that beer. And um, this is uh, this is known as the Narcissus fermentation. Um, he is one of the people that you know first investigated this, and you know the finding was that they would produce you know uh, fully lagered and and maturated beers within a few weeks rather than a few months yeah i think uh charlie said the key is just to get it as close to freezing or even a little below freezing as you possibly can right yeah get it down. because all you're doing is all you're doing is a physical clarification at this point and that's what the cold temperature is native that's what the cold crash is right Right. Of course, it, cold crashing can stress the yeast and cause them to release uh, lipids from their cells, which can have a negative effect on head retention and, and flavor. So um, I don't think we're really advocating cold crashing anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, general chilling, um, you know, degree an hour kind of thing is fine, but, um, you know, not any faster than that. You know, take a couple of days, get it down to those cold temperatures. It'll clarify, and you won't harm the flavor of the beer. Yeah, again, I think I think Bamforth. We're, this is again from an older episode, but he was talking about how he, it's the lower temperature that matters. It's getting it down to that really low temperature that helps uh, uh, get things you know settled yeah, out of the beer quickly. Haze. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's go back to the yeast process now. Uh, the the brewing process. Um, you know, a lot of the byproducts we're talking about are driven by yeast growth rates. How can you manage uh, the yeast growth rates when you're getting ready to brew a beer? Right. Well, the best way to manage the the yeast growth rate and the total growth is by starting your fermentation on the cool end. So you look at your yeast strain. Um, perhaps that yeast strain says it works best from 62 to 70 degrees 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Start out your fermentation, chill your wort before you pitch the yeast down to 60 or 62 degrees, and then pitch uh, a healthy pitch of yeast. And, we're, and you know, we have um, yeast pitching rate calculators um, such as in Beersmith and MrMalty.com and lots of other sources to help you understand how much yeast you need to pitch for a certain gravity. Um, Pitch that yeast at the low end of the fermentation raise, uh, uh, range and then allow that uh, fermentation to start and then slowly increase free rise, if you will, uh, during fermentation. Um, if you hold it steady and then – but at least make sure you hit that diacetyl rest as you start getting down you know, uh, past 75 percent of your total attenuation. Um, so I guess – Total apparent attenuation for most yeast strains is typically about 75%. So as you hit 75% of that 75%, you know, start your diacetyl rest and start raising the temperature. It's uh, roughly the two-thirds break, maybe, roughly? Yes. Something yes. like that. Um, well, pitching rates are also important. Why is it uh, very important that you pitch enough healthy yeast? Well, again, it goes back to trying to ensure that you have yeast that is not you know, reproduced itself to exhaustion, uh, not ready to enter that stationary phase before all the fermentables are gone. If if that is the case, that's, you know, what's called a, you know, stuck fermentation. The yeast are just tired and they can't ferment anymore. And you so, I mean, you don't want to get beer. to that. If you throw like a little bit of yeast and a whole bunch of wort, you can sometimes get it to reproduce maybe five or six times. You don't want to push it that hard, right? Right, you don't want to push it that hard, and you you would end up with an under attenuated beer. So, um, it's it's easy to under pitch. It's difficult to over pitch. Um, you, yes, you can over pitch by putting you know an entire yeast cake into a new beer, and the 
the generally the worst that would happen is that you would end up with a lack of esters. You would end up with a very clean and not very interesting or normal tasting beer just because uh, very little yeast growth would have to occur before uh, the fermentals were all gone. So going back to our nominal pitching rates, about 0.75 um, billion cells per liter per degree Plato. Degree Plato being about four gravity points. And that's for an um, ale, right? For an ale. For an ale, yep. Yeah. Um, and double that for lager, one and a half billion cells per liter per degree Plato. Those are our nominal pitching, recommended pitching rates. Uh, that much yeast um, pitched to the wort will ensure that there should be plant they've only gone through one or two reproductions per cell and they will have lots of vigor and activity left to clean up the beer uh, before you know they're done so after we uh, or when we pitch the yeast uh, what are some of the things we can do you know during active fermentation including aeration i guess to uh, to ensure that we get a healthy fermentation yeah, aeration is very important. Um, yeast nutrients such as zinc is, is important. Today, I mean, yeast health and vigor coming from the yeast companies is very good. Uh, whether you're using liquid yeast or dry yeast, um, you know, these yeast cells have the necessary zinc in them that allows them to fully um, – uh, enzymatically uh, convert acetaldehyde to ethanol. Um, one one problem with re cereal repitching of yeast, such as you would find at a commercial brewery, is that they get low on zinc, um, especially in highly clarified worts, and the they would the brewer will find that they're starting to get more and more acetaldehyde. Is that yeast strain, you know, loses it's zinc reserve. Is that, is, um, that, is that from reusing the yeast too much or what? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So they're repitching it. Yeah. And, and you know, there is a repitching of yeast is a good thing, but you just got to make sure that you have sufficient zinc in your wort or in, you know, as an addition to each fermentation so that the yeast maintain their health. If you just, you know, if it's, They've got to have that that balanced diet. If you just feed them only sugar all the time, you know, seventh, eighth generation, uh, they're going to be malnourished and they won't be able to finish fermenting the beer correctly. Whereas if you do yeast additions, and you'll find that most commercial breweries do, um, then, you know, seven, eight, ten you know, repitches in, um, they're still growing strong. They're producing really a better beer than they did on the first pitch. Um, nice. Um, well, we talked about diacetyl. We talked about the importance of a diacetyl rest at the end of fermentation. What about acetaldehyde? You know, you talked about it uh, extensively, but you didn't really talk about what we might be able to do during fermentation to help clean it up. Right. So, um, Again, acetaldehyde is one of those things that's uh, excreted from the cell uh, during uh, high growth. The faster the yeast is growing, the more of it is it's going to be excreted. So um, what you need to do, again, is start cool, control that initial growth so that the uh, you've controlled the total amount of, di of acetaldehyde that's getting into the wort, into, into the beer. And then make sure that your yeast pitch is adequate to the gravi total gravity of the beer. Again, your pitching rate. Make sure that your aeration is good um, so that you have sufficient yeast vigor um, towards the end of fermentation for them to clean up the, the acetaldehyde. And the third uh, key is make sure that your yeast have sufficient zinc, zinc being a very important cofactor for the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme to convert that acetaldehyde down to ethanol. And uh, how much zinc is needed? Uh, only 0.2 milligrams per liter, 0.2 ppm. That's all that's needed. First pitch from a fresh commercial package, whether dry or liquid, should have sufficient zinc. Uh, second 
a use of that same pitch, you know, like a subsequent pitch harvested from your fermenter, uh, should still have sufficient zinc. Uh, it's on subsequent repitchings that you'll probably want to add a external yeast nutrient, uh, such as what Fermate K and um, uh, well, Fermate O is another one, I think. Uh, yeah, right? there's 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 several on the market. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know these things would would contain uh, zinc and help the uh, yeast maintain that health. Um, okay. Uh, last uh, one other thing I want to ask you about. I, I think you're familiar with uh, accelerated aging. What are some of the accelerated aging things that commercial brewers do to get beer out faster? Well, um, one of them is obviously the diacetyl rest. Um, uh, I guess Charlie told this tale the other day in, in your podcast and I, that I listened to where uh, a brewer would heat up the beer to ensure complete uh, conversion of, acid, of acetyl hydroxy to diacetyl and then run that beer through a column of, uh, of uh, stationary yeast and – not stationary yeast, what's that? Um, Anyway, yeast in a fixed in a column, uh -huh. so that they would be good uh, mass transfer, and the yeast could clean up that freshly converted diacetyl uh, before the beer is packaged. Um, the you know pasteurization is a common practice in many other countries in the world for beer, uh, South America, um, I think Europe. Um, pasteurization is required to prevent spoilage of the beer. Mm -hmm. um, we don't practice it in this country. We, we often do um, uh, filtering. Filtering to, is what, yeah, that was another one yeah. I was going to ask you about was filtering. But. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think especially in, from a craft beer standpoint, we, we recognize that a soured beer is maybe not the intended product, but it is not the end of the world. Um, we recognize sour beers are, you know, a nice thing in and of themselves. Um, and, you know, uh, the the chance of a truly uh, toxic infected beer is remote. Yeah. So, yeah, pasteurization isn't really required, but pasteurization would prevent um, – souring of a beer it would also do this diacetyl conversion it would also kill off any yeast so they would not be able to uh take up the diacetyl so mm -hmm. yeah pasteurization you know really it'll set the flavor um but it really won't clean it won't help aid in cleaning up um right. any diacetyl or acetyl and what about I filtering which is commonly used uh, commercially what about uh how does filtering play into this and can you filter too early for example yeah, you know, um, especially if you have, a, if you've, if you've rushed your beer to market, if you've chilled it too soon um, after fermentation or immediately after dry hopping, um, dry hopping is is all the rage, of course, with IPAs these days, and it's interesting to understand that when you add your dry hops to the beer, that generally you will uh, add micro amounts of oxygen to that wort. I mean, you know, the, the, the dry hops, if you're just pouring them in, you know, their air is coming in with them. Oxygen is. Yeah. On the pellets the obviously have some oxygen in them, right? Right. And hops as a plant have amylase enzyme in them. Um, and so you have now you've added a small amount of oxygen. You've added a small amount of amylase enzyme to the wort. Um, that can include uh, glucoamylase, and what you can actually do is generate further yeast growth with that dry hopping. So. And yeast growth will produce acetohydroxy. And so it's, it, was, it has been common for many uh, brewers to, do, to be fermenting their beer, do their VDK test, you know, say, okay, we have, we've cleaned up all the diacetyl, the VDKs are zero, um, now we can dry hop and then package, and they will dry hop for several days, and then they'll immediately chill the beer um, and prepare it for packaging, and then two weeks later, they're serving the beer out of that keg or out of the bottle, and they notice diacetyl 
where did this come from? Well, it comes from that little bit of growth that was induced by the dry hopping. So when you dry hop, be sure to uh, let, give sufficient time for re the remaining yeast in suspension to clean up uh, and for that acetohydroxide to convert and for the yeast to take that diacetyl up. Mm. So don't dry hop too quickly. Don't rush the beer to market. Um, that's what I want. Well, uh, John, do you have any final tips on yeast health and maturation? Uh, you know, if I went back and probably listened to this, I'd, I'd probably think of a couple things that I may have forgotten, but <laughs> you know, in general, um, yeah, in general, give the yeast time, sufficient time to maturate the beer be, you know, before you package it, before you, you know, put it in a keg, uh, before you send it to market. Um, a diacetyl rest can be used for every fermentation. It will not harm any fermentation. Uh, most of your off flavors are generated early in the high growth phase. So at the end of high growth phase, um, you know, raising the temperature will not hurt the beer flavor in any way. Mm. Well, uh, John, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. I, uh, I hope it's been useful. It was, I think so. Uh, uh, today, my guest was the one and only John Palmer, the author of uh, How to Brew at howtobrew.com and uh, throw his website up there. And I uh, do encourage you to pick up the fourth edition, right, John? You got the fourth edition right. out now? Uh, yeah. Which came out last year. Again, howtobrew.com. Thanks again, John. Thank you very much, Brad. Always a pleasure to be here. A big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for home brewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get 20% off when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018 at beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from the BeerSmith cloud. The BrewVision thermometer, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, BeerSmith Mobile. The mobile version of BeerSmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out BeerSmith Mobile at BeerSmith.com mobile or on the Google Play iTunes, or Amazon app stores. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week.